Our reading for today comes from the book of Psalms, which were sung, songs um, from the Hebrew scriptures, the book of writings. And they are more than anything else, raw expressions of the human experience. They were written sometime between 1500 and 400 BCE. They are timeless in their expression of our need for compassion, support, and courage in times of trouble. Hear these words from Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is with her. She will not fail. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. God lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has made. He makes water cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. So ends our reading. So um, last year, I gave some of the members of our church council um, this book by Brene Brown, The Gifts of Imperfection, Letting Go of Who You Think You're Supposed to Be and Embracing Who You Are, thinking, wow, we really need this. I really need this. And so a few weeks ago, I finished reading this book, this book, The Gift of Imperfection. It was perfect for me and perfect timing for us as well. And for all of us who believe that we and everyone else are supposed to be perfect, be perfectly calm and cool and collected and have it all together, especially in times of trouble. Brown's book reminds me of the earlier wisdom, like the serenity prayer wisdom that derives from our scriptures reminds us to let go of such unrealistic expectations. And so one of my deepest spiritual practices always, and especially now, is just embracing who I am, which as you know, is very, very human. And seeking out, as the psalmist writes, that ever present help. One of the things I love about Brene Brown's work is she courageously and compassionately addresses topics that most of us have been taught to avoid. Almost two decades ago, she turned to her husband, who's a physician, and said, I really want to start a global conversation about vulnerability and shame. Would you sign up for that? Vulnerability and shame? Picture it. If you're meeting somebody for the first time, say it's a job interview or a first date, and someone's asking you, I'd like for you to be vulnerable with me and tell me what you're most ashamed of, would you go there? For most of us, that place is sacred. It's a sacred place of trust that's earned over time. We're very selective with who we share what with, our innermost selves, our most vulnerable selves. Such an invitation would only feel safe in relationships where we know that we are truly loved, that we truly belong. 
for who we are. Am I right? And I believe that there are far too few of those relationships in this world, and especially now in COVID. And Brown's book is this challenge about how and why we might own our imperfections in ways that are liberating and life-giving, not only for ourselves, but for everyone. She writes that vulnerability is the willingness to show up and to be seen with no guarantee of outcome. And she writes, she adds, it is the only path to more love, more belonging, and more joy. Notice she doesn't say that vulnerability is the only path to quote unquote success, fame, and wealth. Because as we see, sometimes people lie and cheat and steal their way into success, fame, and wealth. But here's the twist. There are plenty of people with high levels of success, fame, and fortune who don't know how to be vulnerable and therefore don't have a real sense of being loved unconditionally for who they really are. They don't have a sense of truly belonging and the joy in knowing that. I see some heads nodding. So in the spirit of vulnerability, I'd like to share a few stories of my own vulnerability about falling down and getting back up again and again and again. And it all starts in childhood as it does with so many of us. So as a child, I had terrible stage fright talking with people. You know, my father stammered. I think it was something that was passed down through generations. There was this fear. And so I have these two vivid PTSD memories of freezing on stage I've shared with some of you, so bear with me. The first time was, I was five years old. My um, parents decided they wanted us to take ballet lessons. So my older sister, Karen and I um, were in a performance. Karen was dressed as a snowflake. I was dressed as a rooster. I was five years old. I had a run in my nylons. Um, Karen's group got out first and they danced beautifully and then they were dancing behind us and then the younger children came forward and the moment I stepped on stage and the spotlight went on I looked around and all I could see was a sea of faces and in the front row was my Aunt Estelle, my mother and my grandmother and I just froze like a deer in the headlights. I couldn't move. And afterwards, driving home in the car, I was curled in the fetal position in the back seat while everyone thought I was asleep. And I heard my mother and Anastelle and Mime praising my older sister. And I think they thought I was asleep. And so then they were referring to me, shaking their heads, saying, all that money, all that time on those ballet lessons, all that money. So I went even further into that fetal position. The second time it happened, I was 13 or 12. Another scenario, um, piano recital. Um, my sister performed first. She did really well. So my, my, my piano piece was Rachmaninoff's Prelude. And the beginning starts off with dun, dun, dun. And so right before I started, I remember I had more attention on, it was like the eyes in the back of my head seeing Aunt Estelle, my mother and Meme there thinking all that money, all those lessons, all that money. And I wasn't even thinking about Rachmaninoff or anything else. And I hit all three chords wrong. And I remember hearing this, <gasps> I think that was my mother. <laughs> and then, and then my, my piano teacher, Angie Spolanti said, just take a deep breath and just begin again. It was just the comfort of her voice. And I let go. I had to let go. And just what I learned, you know, the same thing happened in the car. This time it was praising Karen and there was silence about me, but already that, that chorus of voices became active and alive in my head. All that money. All that money. Um, and 
And so I developed some performance anxiety. I was terrified on a deep level, a vulnerable level of disappointing those I love and those whose love I needed. And so I had to learn a new way of self-compassion and wisdom to be still and quiet that critical mind or those voices and consciously choose to focus my attention on love rather than fear. Loving what I'm doing, whether it's dance or piano or pickleball or being here with you now, loving the people I'm with rather than focusing on my fear of others, fear of their criticism, and especially fear of my own internal critic. Can any of you relate to this? So I don't know about you, but my inner critic has been more vocal lately. It often happens when I'm stressed. Perhaps that's your experience as well. Um, in those times, as the psalmist writes about, when it seems like your world, your life, your foundation is being shaken to the core. Be still and know that I am God. I had to rethink and reimagine God because if God was another one of those angry, critical voices that wasn't going to help, that judge, be still with unconditional love and compassion and curiosity and faith. Be with the one who loves you as you are. Be with that inner child who can become so easily hurt, who is so vulnerable, who can become so defensive, who so longs for love and needs love and has already internalized that critical chorus of voices of those whose love we need. And be with the most important thing is the awareness that so many of us need this safe place to belong, to be listened to with understanding and love and compassion, and even more importantly, to become that safe and compassionate place for others to be love for ourselves and for others. And so at my best, um, when I hear those voices coming up, as I have a lot the last couple of weeks, I greet them as the adult Lori saying, oh, hi, mom. Hi, auntie. Hi, Mime. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. <sighs> so remember um, Brene Brown's insight that vulnerability, the willingness to show up and to be seen with no guarantees of outcomes is the only path to more love, belonging, and joy. Over the years, I have learned so much about myself through each one of you here. Not only about what I'm good at doing, but facing what I'm not so good at doing. And I'm learning how hard it is for me sometimes to let go and to ask for help. And I've learned a lot about you, about myself, not only as a minister, but especially as a human being. And I need you to know that I love and I value, and I am grateful for each one of you. So there's another really important clarification that's connected with vulnerability and how it interacts with shame. Shame causes us to wanna to hide and not reach out. Shame is the huge difference between saying I failed and I am a failure. One is something that I did. The other is something that I am. Any one of us may fail repeatedly, but I'd even question that word failing because how does innovation happen? How does creativity and learning happen? How does a child learn how to walk? They fall a lot before they get up. So maybe the only failure is not to try. None of us is a failure. Failing 
is we learn. And seeing ourselves as a failure can lead to shame. And so in contrast with shame as an emotion, guilt and empathy can be helpful emotions, causing us to examine how our actions have impacted others. But shame is different from guilt or empathy. Shame is much more likely to be the cause of destructive behavior rather than the cure. Because shame goes at our inherent worth and dignity and nothing, no one has the right to do that. Each of us has immeasurable worth and dignity. Just being who each one of us is. So her recommendation in relationship with shame is to talk with ourselves in the same way that we would talk with someone we love. Sometimes, I don't know about you, but sometimes I can be really hard on myself. Can any of you be hard on yourselves? Not on me, on yourselves. <laughs> so talk to yourself the same way you would talk to your own child, because that really is who you're talking to. I mean, there are all these layers of us, right? You made a mistake, you're human, or even more, you tried. You got up and you tried to play the piano. You got up and you tried to be a ballerina. You know, the encouraging voice, the one that, that encourages risk and vulnerability. And you don't have to do it like anyone else. And I think the power of curiosity is really, really helpful. Rather than judgment and shame, it gets in the way. Curiosity is, what, what can I learn? And also reach out to someone who has earned your trust, who's earned the right to hear your story, has the capacity to respond with empathy. And you may find that sharing your story of shame with someone you trust may end up giving them permission down the line to share with you or with someone else something they've been hiding or repressing. So those of you, um, Entrepreneurs, there's, a, um, there's an event that Brown describes in her book, and it's called FailCon. It's like short for failure conference. And it's for entrepreneurial founders of startup companies to learn from and prepare for failure so that they can iterate and grow fast. What attendees of these conferences report is that they still associate failures with sadness, fear, making a fool of myself, desperation, panic, shame, and heartbreak. But when they ask about the people who are willing to be vulnerable and share their stories at FailCon, the attendees see them as helpful, generous, open, knowledgeable, brave, courageous. Isn't that fascinating? We get in our own ways, that internal critic. But there's a flip side to this dynamic. When we refuse to be vulnerable and try to hide our failures from others, we create the conditions for shame to grow. It grows hidden. Often our repressed feelings come out in pathological ways. In Brown's words, there are too many people today who instead of feeling hurt, act out their hurt. Instead of acknowledging their pain, they're inflicting pain on others. Rather than risk feeling disappointed, they're choosing to live disappointed. She's learned to see emotional stoicism, blustery posturing and swagger as signs of someone moving in the opposite direction of that vulnerable path that leads to love, belonging and joy. Um, as it relates to this path of vulnerability, one of Brown's favorite quotes is from Teddy Roosevelt's 1910 speech, Man in the Arena. And I quote, it is not the critic who counts, not the one who points out how the strong person stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done better. The credit belongs to the one who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and tears and blood, who strives valiantly, 
who at their best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement and who at the worst, if they fail, at least fails while daring greatly. What might that look like for you in your life at this time? What arena is calling you? And where might you, where might we together as friends and as people of faith dare greatly? I'd like to close with the words again, the conclusion of Brene Brown's book, Rising Strong. Hear these words. When we show up with our whole selves, when we are all in, when we dare greatly, there is no greater threat to the cynics, to the critics, to the fear mongers than those of us who are willing to face and risk falling because we have learned how to rise up with our wounds and our bruised hearts. We choose owning our struggle over hiding and hustling and pretending. When we deny our stories, they end up defining us. When we run from struggle, we are never free. So when we own our truth and look it in the eye and we dare to write a different ending, we craft love from heartbreak, compassion from shame, courage from failure. Our power is showing up 